it all. This recording pin you're on. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. This Shabbat uh, marks the conclusion of the Chumash of Bamidbar. Uh, the Chumash of Bamidbar is uh, basically narrative. There are certainly mitzvot and uh, ideas that are communicated within it, but it tells us the story of the Jewish people, Bamidbar, what they did in the desert of Sinai. And the concluding parsha is Ve'ele Masei B'nei Yisrael. These are the journeys of the Jewish people, the way stations that they stopped at. And the Torah lists for us uh, over 40 places that uh, the Jewish people uh, encamped at uh, during the 40 years in the desert. And Farshim point out that most of these places, uh, they did not stay a long period of time. In one of them, in Kodesh, they stayed 38 years. So that the uh, other places only occupied two years of the 40 years. So the question arises that all the Mephoshim discuss What's the message here? What do we learn from this? We got a list of uh, places, uh, you know, that uh, really don't say anything to us. Strange names, uh, oases in the desert. So Rashi, who is... Uh, the first and foremost of all of the commentators to Chumash. So Rashi already raises the question immediately. And Rashi quotes a medrash. The medrash that he quotes is that uh, a father retracing a journey that he and his son took when the son was yet very young. So he tells him, you know, we went to this place and here you had a headache. And then we went to this place and here you didn't feel well. He went to this place and here we were attacked by bandits. And that this is therefore the same idea when the Torah describes Masse B'nai Yisrael that Moshe tells them, look what happened in each place. It's what we call associative memory. If we remember the place, we remember somehow what happened in the place. And uh, because of that, therefore, the uh, recounting of these places of oases, of way stations in the desert, uh, take on a meaning. However, uh, the Mephoshim point out that that would only apply to the generation of Moshe. Yeah. To later generations that did not, so to speak, have a headache in this place, that did not experience uh, what happened in this place, so then it remains a uh, mystery. Why should we have to know it? Why should we have to read about it? 
So uh, the Ramban and others uh, say you are very, uh, almost a prophetic uh, explanation. Over the long history of the Jewish people, we've been everywhere in the world. <clears throat> Where have we not been? And where have we not had an experience? But just like the uh, way stations in the desert, uh, there was a goal, there was a destination. It was true there were 42 stops on the way, but we're going somewhere. Where are we going? We're going to the land of Israel. There are a lot of interruptions on the way. It's not a smooth journey. An entire generation will not uh, survive to complete the journey. But when there is a goal, when there is a destination, so even the interim stops have meaning, have uh, a, uh, an importance that otherwise they would not have. And because of that, therefore, the Torah tells us about all of these places because every place contributed, so to speak, to the fact that eventually we're going to get there to Israel. To get there to Israel took 42 stops. Now, we read that when the Jewish people left Egypt, they're only 11 days away from Eretz Israel. So according to the master plan, they should go to Har Sinai, three-day journey, accept the Torah, take a week to absorb what the Torah taught us, keep on going, and uh, then they're in Eretz Yisrael. Well, how could it be that an 11-day journey takes 40 years? How could it be that the greatest generation, so to speak, in the history of Klai Yisrael, a generation that is characterized as being a Dordea, a generation of intelligence, of wisdom, of understanding, a generation that, so to speak, saw heaven on earth, said Nasev and Ishma, how did they even... How did they mess it up like this? How did they take the first and point out, and the Ramban, it's the Cheskuni, others as well, that uh, the Torah, uh, when we say, Masay Avo Simon Labonim, that what happened to our forefathers is indicative of what will happen in later generations as well, that's not restricted to the Chumash Breshis. It's not restricted to the stories of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But that the entire Torah, so to speak, is Masei Ovasim and Labonim. And the Ramban uh, points that out that by Bayashani. So Bayashani, the second base of English. So you read Ezra at the head of the people. Now Ezra is like Moshe Rabbeinu. 
Chazal say, Ilmoe nitna Torah l'yidei Moshe, nitna l'yidei Ezra. If the Torah would not have been given by Moshe, it would have given by Ezra. Meaning that Ezra is his potential, in his greatness, is as great as Moshe. And you have the Anshayk Nesses Abdullah, and you have the prophets, Chagai, Scharia, Malachi, the Novi Yechevsko. So the Bayesheni should have been an enormous success. The king of uh, Persia, Korish, and later his heirs, Doryovish, uh, tell the Jewish people, go home, it's, you can go home, it's open. And not only that, there arises a uh, Jewish uh, official, Nehemiah, and he uh, is able to organize a security and a defense for the Jewish people. They defeat the Shomronim. They begin the construction of the Second Temple. Second Temple should have been a raving success. Especially having once tasted what the exile is, because all of this happens after the story of Purim. So one would have imagined that uh, there would be enormous pressures within the Jewish world for the return to the land of Israel and for uh, the establishment of the Second Commonwealth and the uh, rebuilding of the temple in all of its glory. And we would expect that we would not repeat the mistakes that destroyed the first temple. However, just as the Masay B'nai Yisrael that should have taken 11 days in leaving Egypt ends up being a 40 year sojourn in the desert that will kill millions of Jews who will not survive it. So too will we see this with the second temple. The second temple, if you look at it, Chazal characterizes it to a certain extent as a failure. It was missing a lot of things. When, the, when Chazal say it was missing, we're not talking just about the fact that the artifact was missing, that there was no one in Kodesh. It's because it was, whatever the Orin Kodesh was, was missing. And the majority of the Jewish people never came back. The majority of the Jewish people stayed in the exile, stayed in Bovel. There's a legend, you know, the legends need not be uh, historically accurate. There's a famous idea that uh, exists amongst uh, Jewish historians is that there are two things that don't have to coincide. One is historical fact, and one is Jewish memory. And that the Jewish people survive not on historical fact, but they survive on memory. And we all know that our memories play tricks with us. We think that we remember accurately. But many times in life, we are aware that we didn't remember it exactly the way it happened. 
but nevertheless, we are creatures of our memory. We are not creatures of historical fact. And that's one of the great problems of secularism in the Jewish world, is that it wants to deal with historical fact and it ignores memory. The problem with historical fact is that you uh, we can't constantly rewriting it. We find new uh, evidence for all sorts of things. But memory is much more solid. So the, uh, we have a legend, very interesting legend. Uh, there were uh, three Jewish communities that were destroyed in the First Crusade in 1096 in the Rhineland. Uh, it was Kihuot Shum. Shum is Shin Vov Mem, Shapiro, Vermeiza, Magenza. So Shapiro is uh, what in English we call spires. Vermeiser is worms, the Magenza is Mainz. It was a tri community, three separate, but with one Kihira, one Beth, and one etc. It's very famous. And Rashi studied there. I mean, Gershom was the Rav in uh, Mainz, and uh, he was the Gom. And really, that's the establishment of Ashkenazic Jewry in the 9th and 10th centuries in Europe. So the question arose in Jewish memory, not in accuracy. So in accuracy, what happened was that the crusaders on the way to Palestine said, well, what do we have to go to Palestine to kill infidels? We got infidels right here we can kill. And uh, the surest time in the Jewish world, it's part of the sphere thing as well, uh, was a sad time because these three Jewish communities were destroyed. Uh, hundreds of Jews were killed. It was a time when you Hundreds of Jews was enough to make it the Shoah. In our time, we've upped the ante. I just, uh, you know, I, I diverge, but uh, there's like 150 Jews got killed in Surfside, Florida, right? It's certainly that many. They got they got bodies for some, but there's still 110 that are missing. Right. After 10 days, 12 days, nobody's walking out of that collapsed building. So we naturally share in the tragedy, but uh, we're not going to declare a fast day because of it. Because it's only 150. And 150 is a small change. But in the Middle Ages, 150 was big. So uh, Jewish memory asked the question, why were those three communities destroyed? What did they do that was so bad? Because Jewish memory always sees that there's a cause and effect to things. We see the effect, but what's the cause? Why did it happen? And we always want to know why, even though most of the time we are unable to come to a satisfactory explanation. So the legend is, again, memory. It's not historical accuracy. The legend is that Ezra Sofer, 
that, the, that those three Jewish communities existed at the time of the beginning of Ayasheni. Hard to imagine, could be though. Because there were Jews in Europe uh, uh, already uh, from the dawn of Europe onwards. And that Ezra Sofer sent them a letter and said, we're rebuilding the temple, come, we need you. And they said to him, Ezra, we're in good shape here. You, you know, ask people who are closer, we're far away, we're all right. And because they didn't come back, when Ezra asked them to come back, so therefore, uh, a millennia later, a millennium later, they were destroyed first. That's memory. It's not historical accuracy. But again, it reflects how Jews looked at things. So that's a replay of the 42 way stations in the desert. And we find that uh, in the, uh, I mentioned at Shabbos, I think it's uh, worthy of mention again. Uh, the daughters of Slavchod said, Avinu Meis Bamidbor. Our father died in the desert. So what does that mean, our father died in the desert? We know their father died. That's what they came. They were talking about inheritance. If the father didn't die, then what's the whole conversation? So the, the answer is, they said, our father died in the desert. Our father had an opportunity, as did that entire generation, and an opportunity to go to Eretz Israel. They were only 11 days away. He leaves Egypt, he's in the Kabul, the Torah, he's a... And he missed the opportunity. He was, died in the desert. We don't want to miss the opportunity, they said. Yeah, we want our share in Eretz Israel. We don't want to miss the opportunity. We don't want to go through another 42 stops. Because we all know we're all going to get there, that they know. But we want to make sure that we have a chilek and a nachalo, and that we have the inheritance of our father in Eretz Yisrael. So that was the message of the Masei B'nai Yisrael, that the Ram, the Rambam and the Chizkumi see, they, they see the future. So he missed out on Ba'i Yisheni. So Ba'i Yisheni turned out to be a disappointment, right? Uh, with the exception of the uh, short period of the reign of some of the Hashmanoim kings, uh, the Baishen never lived up to its potential. It came under Greek influence, it came under Roman influence, it, the Jewish people lost their autonomy, they lost their independence. The Baish itself, we, uh, we uh, we're in the midst of uh, commemorating its destruction. And they never recovered from it. And that was a tragedy. It remains a tragedy. So, the Ramban came there to Israel in 1263. I think, no, I'm sorry, 1267. 1263 was the debate. Well, the, the, the Ramban comes there and says, well, he can't have a minion in the New Shalai. He doesn't find 10 Jews. 
So why did he come? Ramban was a man of wealth. If he couldn't stay in Spain, he could have gone. He could have gone to Egypt. He could have gone to Babylonia. He could have gone to Jewish places all over the world. Uh, so because he wanted to personalize and actualize himself, his commentary to the Torah. And so to speak, if he had an opportunity, he wanted to take hold of the opportunity. He wanted to follow through on it. So the entire story of the Jewish people in the exile is the story of Masse. There are more than 42 stops. There's, uh, it's not 40 years, it's 1800 years, 1900 years. And it's not just stops, uh, so to speak, in one geographic location. So there's a famous word from the uh, Rebbe of Breslov, from Nachman. He said, every step that I take is towards Yerushalayim. And by that he meant that uh, The exile is not permanent. There's a goal. It's a way station. The only thing is there are so many way stations that you get to think that the way stations have permanence to them. That they somehow will always be there. And if there's any lesson that the exile should have taught us by now is that it is very uncertain. And no matter how many centuries the Jews are in a country, no matter how well established they are, no matter how they feel, uh, it's still only a way station. So the Torah says, Ve'ele Masse B'nei Yisrael. You should know that it's a journey. And these are the places that we are going to. And I went from one place, Va'yisu Va'yachanu, Va'yisu Va'yachanu. It went from one place to another and settled and came back and went again. But there's a goal, there's a purpose. And one should never lose sight of the purpose. One should never lose sight of the fact that there is to be a destination at the end. We also realize that it always is Vayisu Vayachan. And that therefore our destination should be clear. We should see it that way. We should take advantage of opportunities that present themselves for us and rely on Jewish memory in order to steer us in the right direction. So Shabbat Shalom and Chodesh Tov. Thank you, Mark. Okay,